Edinburgh, a city like no other. Adrian and I have visited hundreds of cities, but nothing comes close to how uniquely memorable this Scottish capital city is, steeped in so much history in a city of proud and wonderful people. Join me and Adrian as we explore this city's unforgettable destinations, one-of-a-kind places of significance like Kirkyards, and charming streets that inspired countless stories, including haunted places like the underground vaults. Find out how we liked Scottish food like haggis and a deep-fried Mars bar. See how we enjoyed high tea and the world-renowned Scottish whiskey. And make sure to stay till the end for valuable travel tips and fun spots that we visited. Adrian and I have many more destinations to share with you. Now let us show you these unforgettable places and provide you with the information to help you plan your perfect vacation. Subscribe now to get updates of our upcoming videos. After our trip to York, Adrian and I got on the road early in the morning to make our way to Edinburgh through scenic roads and past historic sites like the former home of Mary Queen of Scots. We were excited to see what Edinburgh had in store for us. Nestled between the Pentland Hills and the North Sea, Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The city is divided into two, the medieval Old Town and the Georgian New Town. The most renowned part of Old Town is the historic Royal Mile, which connects Edinburgh Castle with the Palace of Holyrood House. We started our trip at the most famous end of the Royal Mile, the world-famous Edinburgh Castle. We came here during the bank holiday weekend and we expected it to quickly get busy and crammed with tourists like us. So we made sure to arrive just as the castle opened its doors at 9.30 a.m. Here's a top tip. Rent an audio guide for a small fee to learn about the castle's history in detail. It will make your visit a lot more worth it. The castle is a historic fortress perched atop a volcanic rock and has dominated over Scotland's capital city since the 11th century. Perhaps the castle's most famous past resident is Mary Queen of Scots. Here you can see a timeline of her stay in the tiny room where she gave birth to her son, King James VI of Scotland. The Scottish crown jewels are displayed here too, but we were not allowed to film where they were kept. Visitors can also explore the Great Hall, which was completed for King James IV in 1512. Its wooden roof is said to be one of the most spectacular in all of Britain. The castle also houses the Mons Meg, which is one of the largest cannons ever built. Adrian and I also stepped into St. Margaret's Chapel, the oldest building in the castle, which was built in 1130. It is worth taking the time to see all of the attractions in the castle, including the Scottish National War Memorial, the Dog Cemetery, the military prison built in 1842 to house soldiers in solitary confinement, the Dragoon Guards Museum, and the Museum of Prisons of War where hundreds of prisoners were kept in the dark vaults below. The walls of the castle seemed to whisper stories to you wherever we went, but it was also the perfect place to appreciate how stunning the city of Edinburgh truly is. I made sure not to miss the opportunity to have high tea at the castle's tea rooms, where we were treated to delicious pastries and dainty sandwiches. I highly recommend doing this during a visit to the castle, but it's always a good idea to book ahead of time when you purchase your tickets online due to its popularity. From the castle, we continued to explore Edinburgh's cobbled streets on our way to our next stop, the National Museum of Scotland. 
Visiting the museum is free and is absolutely worth it for both children and adults of all ages. Formed in 2006, it houses countless of collections of artifacts and interactive displays that we could literally spend hours viewing and playing with. One of its most notable displays is the stuffed body of Dolly the Sheep, the first cloned mammal from an adult cell. In addition to this, the building is stunningly beautiful and if it weren't for the fact that we were short on time, we would probably have spent several hours exploring the entire museum. The museum's rooftop is also a perfect place to see amazing views, especially of the castle. It was drizzling when we left the museum, so we opted to have some delicious pastries and coffees on our way to our next destination, Greyfriars Kirkyard. Here you will find the grave of Greyfriars Bobby, a Sky Terrier who became famous for unwaveringly guarding the grave of his owner for 14 years until his death in 1872. Greyfriars Kirkyard is quite famous for its history, but also for its numerous ghost sightings. The Kirkyard is quite small, but it houses 500,000 dead bodies, some of who were buried in such shallow graves, bones have been said to pop out through the thin soil. But if you're a Harry Potter fan, you will find the grave that apparently inspired the muggle name for Voldemort, Thomas Riddle. The skies may have been grey on that day, but when we visited Victoria Street, it didn't matter. Lined with colorful Flemish-style buildings, Victoria Street is an uphill cobblestone lane in Old Town. Full of cafes and famous eateries, like the famous Bertie's Fish and Chip restaurant, which we tried to get into but it was so busy we couldn't get a seat. So we just ended up getting takeaway from the little booth at the first floor. Shopping on Victoria Street is fun and if you're after amazing candles, head to the Isle of Skye Candle Shop. Victoria Street also claims to be the inspiration for Diagon Alley which we can kind of see, but what makes it unique is the fact that the street makes up of two stories with more shops and restaurants above street level. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is quite possibly the most photographed street in Edinburgh. What really fascinated me though was the fact that the upper level leads to the other streets and closes. All around Old Town, you will find narrow alleys that they call closes. In medieval times, these closes were an entryway to tall buildings that housed majority of Edinburgh's citizens. They were called close as they had to be closed especially at night to protect the private entryway. But one of the most popular of them all is Advocates Close, with its stunning view as you walk deeper into the alley. It was like stepping back in time, don't you think? The other popular close is Mary King's Close, which Adrian and I found very fascinating to visit. Edinburgh has a very dark past, and Mary King's Close holds one of the keys to this depressing piece of history. Mary King was a merchant burgess who resided in the Close in the 17th century. A prominent fabric merchant, the Close was named after her. This close was partially buried in the 18th century and up to 300 residents died during the Great Plague in 1645. Back then, a close would have tall wooden buildings as tall as eight stories high that housed many, many residents in cramped and poorly maintained spaces. Due to the many tragedies that have happened here in the past, Mary King's close is said to be very haunted by many spirits. Many ghost hunters have claimed to have had sightings here. The most recent one is a girl named Annie, who was encountered by a Japanese psychic in the 1990s. During the psychic's visit, Annie clung to her trouser leg, heartbroken because she had lost her favorite doll. Communicating with Annie by the fireplace, the psychic bought a doll from a shop on the Royal Mile and brought it back to Annie which pleased her. The psychic said that as long as a doll remains by the fireplace, the room will never again be disturbed by Annie's spirit. Since then, many have left toys and mementos on the same spot, but the actual doll was stolen in 1990. Today, many people continue the visit to Close, including a gentleman named Charles who used to be a prince and is now a king. 
During our tour, we learned a new word, gardilou, which in French means watch out for the water. In the medieval times, this word was used a lot. Back then, they had no toilets. Their version of a toilet was a bucket in the room which was shared. Whenever it needed to be emptied, they would throw the contents of the bucket out the window, and whoever had the pleasure of doing so had to shout, Gardilou! to warn anyone below of the nasty shower they were about to get. Can you just imagine that? After the tour, we shopped and found pots of blood, jam, and candies disguised as vile things like blood, bubos, veins, and leeches, and admired the flowers at the foot of this interesting-looking fella. Take the tour to find out who that dude is. Edinburgh's new town isn't actually new anymore, dating back to the 18th century. Prince's Street is perhaps the most famous street in this part of the city, and the main train station Waverley can be found here. Prince's Street is lined with elegant Georgian townhouses, shops, restaurants, and bars, but a lot of the local shopping on the street has moved to the new St. James Quarter, also home to this building resembling a particular emoji that is the W Hotel. Our favorite spot in Newtown is the Princess Street Gardens, a tranquil oasis in the city with its picture-perfect views of the castle, especially at night. It is hard to believe that this place used to be a smelly lock where sewage and bodies were dumped. Another stunning feature of Princess Street is the Scott Monument. A grand tribute to the famous Scottish writer Sir Walter Scott. However, we came to Princess Street for another reason, to indulge in the Johnny Walker Whiskey Experience. You don't have to like whiskey to enjoy this activity. It's so much fun. The tour starts with you taking a quiz to get profiled. You then get matched to a band color, which determines what flavors you like most. Then, your entire experience is mostly shaped by the color and flavor profile you've been matched with. We weren't allowed to film during the tour, but here are some pics to give you an idea of what we did. After a short presentation on the origins of Johnny Walker, we were taken to several rooms where we had several tastings of whiskey paired with all kinds of flavors. And they were delicious. I don't like whiskey, and I enjoyed it. We also made a reservation at the restaurant in the building, the 1820, where they served amazing cocktails. The restaurant is on the topmost floor, and as expected, the views of the city were spectacular. The restaurant had a few but top-notch choices for food, and vegetarian options were available as well. After taking in the views, we had our delicious meals and topped them with another cocktail. It's also worth mentioning that there is a jazz bar adjacent to the restaurant. I think we ended up enjoying the drinks way too much. We struggled to take a picture of us in the end. But hey, we ended up having a really good night's sleep. After our adventure at Johnny Walker the night before, we decided that the best cure for a hangover is a classic British fry-up. And no trip to Edinburgh would be complete without listening to the marvelous sounds of bagpipes playing, especially on the Royal Mile. Well, and you probably think we're here to talk about that. Edinburgh's Tollbooth Prison, and as the name kind of gives it away, it was a prison, and everyone hated it. Slap bang in the middle of your city centre, right on your high street, but it wasn't just criminals getting thrown in, but also innocent people thrown in, and quite brutally tortured at times. This is a very common sight up and down the Royal Mile and all the side streets. You'll see hundreds of them. It's a close. There's so many of these because those used to be the streets of Edinburgh. That's all they had between the buildings. This was the exception, it was for royalty, oh, wow. connects the castle and the palace, it was always pretty big. The rest were like that. The reason that's the case, Edinburgh used to be very small, and it used to have big... Uh, the boss now, uh, it looks a bit odd, we'll go upstairs 
exist. Uh, so follow me, we'll get inside, I'll explain it more what I'm inside. Watch out for this big step. Edinburgh has so many fascinating and very dark stories to tell. And taking part in the Edinburgh Vaults tour gave us a fascination of hearing a lot more. We're all about the history of the vaults. Sadly, we don't have time for the stuff on the walls. The only reason I brought you in is so we can talk about this. The Edinburgh Vaults are a network of chambers hidden beneath the South Bridge in the city. Built in the 18th century, they were initially intended for shops and storage. However, flooding and poor conditions soon made them unsuitable for businesses. The dark, damp vaults then became a refuge for the poor and homeless, and even harbored darker activities. Today, they're a popular tourist attraction with ghost tours, exploring their history and rumored hauntings. These are some of the items left by a group that resided in these vaults recently. Apparently, they wanted to clear the vaults of the spirits that haunted them, but after one particularly scary episode, they were forced to flee. This stone circle? We were dared to step into it, and I was one of the stupid ones who did. I highly recommend this tour and we went with Ald Ricky Tours, who were very fantastic. Our guide, Jordan, was exceptional. Book their tours on their website. After being in that dark and sinister place for nearly an hour, I needed a good laugh. And I just got that as soon as we stepped out. Whether you are a fan of the royal family or not, visiting the Royal Yacht Britannia in Leith is a must. The yacht holds many fascinating stories, so make sure to grab an audio guide before starting the tour. The Royal Yacht Britannia, once the pride of the British royal family, served for over 44 years. Launched in 1953, this magnificent ship traveled over a million miles, carrying the Queen and royals on official visits to 600 ports in 135 countries. Decommissioned in 1997, Britannia is now a beloved tourist attraction. Visitors can explore its five decks, including the state apartments, crew quarters, royal vehicles, and the grand dining room. Here is a fun activity. Try to spot all of the stuffed corgis hidden all over the ship. There are quite a few of them. Also, make sure to have a snack or a cup of tea and a scone in the tea room. One place that we really enjoyed in Old Town is Grass Market. It is home to several historic pubs, including the smallest pub in Scotland, the Wee Pub. Now, let me tell you, Wee in Scottish means small. It's not a pub for weeing in. And the last drop, which was once a public gathering place for executions. Each pub has a story to tell, so make sure to read the storyboards at the entryway. We were lucky to have been in Edinburgh on a Saturday, since this is when the famous weekly market is on. It was a great way to sample food from cuisines all over the world, and a great place to shop for artisan goods. My favorite was this paella stand, and would you believe that the vendor gave me an entire plate for free? Edinburgh's grass market was once a bustling livestock market dating back to the 14th century. While its past may hold a touch of macabre, like public executions, today the grass market is a vibrant hub that comes alive at night. You're probably thinking, what's up with this music? Well, it's because the next place I'm about to show you is full of fun and games. And I'm talking about Camera Obscura. It's a place that's fully interactive with different activities and displays in each one of the six floors. It's a place where you'll never get bored, may get creeped out a bit, or do a weird dance in front of a thermal camera. And get awfully stumped by losing your balance in a tunnel of spinning lights. I also play
placed my head on a table and forgot where the rest of my body was. That's the rest of your body. Don't know. And at the top, we were treated to some stunning views of the city, including the Tollbooth Kirk. And of course, Edinburgh Castle. We enjoyed the breathtaking views from the top and got the chance to see a real camera obscura. Their shop was full of goodies and fun games and funny books. This is a great place to visit in Edinburgh and I recommend that you book your tickets online. Ever heard of a fried Mars bar? I have, so I decided to give this fried chocolate bar a try. It's definitely one of the delicacies in Scotland that people always talk about. After taking a bite, I didn't really know what to make of it. It didn't taste bad, but there was something alien about that texture. I wasn't a big fan. Okay. I'm not the biggest fan, but it's okay. <laughs> so I just consoled myself with some fish and chips. Does it say we're gonna have a good day today? Scran by the Royal Mile is a popular breakfast place, and Adrian and I could see why. With its adorable decor and delicious food, I wouldn't hesitate to return here the next time we are in Edinburgh. But it is also the place where we decided to try the infamous haggis. For those of you unfamiliar with haggis, it's a savory pudding made with sheep or calf's offal, mixed with spices, suet, and oatmeal. Let's see how our tasting went. <laughs> Quiet. Just the house. Yeah, I'm getting plenty of it. It's got funky texture. It does. I apologize to those who love haggis, but I barely touched my plate, and my waitress wasn't too happy. A few steps away from Scran is this very charming place, Cockburn Street. It's a place for haggis lovers and cute eateries. Cockburn Street is lined with quirky and adorable shops housed in these beautiful historic buildings. The Museum Context Store is a paradise for Harry Potter fans with all of its amazing merchandise, including wands. Tom Kirk is an empty church and a well-known landmark on the Royal Mile that's great for shopping for local and artisan goods. It was full of quirky stuff, most of which display the Scottish sense of humor. The church was formerly opened and dedicated to Christ by the citizens of Edinburgh in 1641. Now, the multiple stained glass windows remain as a reminder of the past. The heart of Edinburgh's old town beats along the Royal Mile. This bustling stretch of over a mile is a history lover's paradise with its ancient buildings and multiple historic sites. Today, the Royal Mile is a vibrant mix of shops, historical attractions, pubs and performers, offering a captivating introduction to Edinburgh's spirit. We took our time walking towards the Palace of Holyrood House and just explored every corner of this road. The Royal Mile is full of closes, and here we found Dunbar's Close Garden, a 17th century garden perfect for a spring walk with its flowers, trimmed hedges, and trees. Further down the Royal Mile is the Canongate Kirkyard, a historic cemetery used from the 1680s to the mid 20th century. Notable figures like the father of modern economy, Adam Smith, are buried here. In the yard is the charming Canongate Kirk, a small historic church that dates back to the 17th century. It is also the parish church for Edinburgh Castle and the Palace of Holyrood House. Through White Horse Close, we were able to get to the new Kelton Burial Ground. 
It may seem strange to keep visiting graveyards, but Edinburgh's New Calton Burial Ground offers more than just a final resting place. This 19th century cemetery boasts of panoramic views of the city, including Arthur's Seat. A popular hiking spot in Edinburgh, Arthur's Seat is an extinct volcano with panoramic city views. It is a moderate hike with a scenic round trip taking about two and a half hours. Our last stop before reaching the Palace of Holyrood House is Calton Hill. Calton Hill is a popular spot for locals and visitors. This extinct volcano, offering panoramic cityscapes, is topped with a collection of historic monuments. Quite possibly the most famous one is the National Monument, a replica of the Athenian Parthenon, but it's inaccurately nicknamed Edinburgh's disgrace for remaining unfinished. With its stunning views and the monuments serving as shadowy figures, many come here to take breathtaking pictures of the city. Calton Hill is also the perfect place for sunrise and sunset. On our way to the palace from Calton Hill, we climb down the steep steps of Jacob's Ladder. Before ending our last day in Edinburgh, we paid a visit to the British monarch's residence in Scotland, the Palace of Holyrood House. Steeped in Scottish history and located at the foot of the Royal Mile, it's been the center of royal life since the 16th century. The palace whispers tales of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Bonnie Prince Charlie, offering a glimpse into Scotland's royal past and present. We explored the grand state apartments and wandered the ruins of the adjacent 12th century Holyrood Abbey which was founded in 1128 by David I of Scotland. Legend says that the abbey was erected as an act of gratitude to God, and this was done by David after a miraculous apparition of the crucifix saved him from being gored by a stag on this very same spot where the abbey was built. And what about the name Holy Rood? What does it mean? Rood is a word for cross, and Holy Rood means Holy Cross, referring to the cross that Jesus Christ was crucified on. And our last stop before driving back to England was St. Giles Cathedral. St. Giles Cathedral, also known as the High Kirk of Edinburgh, is a magnificent church standing proudly on Edinburgh's Royal Mile. Its architectural heritage is fascinating, with a blend of styles reflecting its long history that began in the 12th century. Historical figures such as James Graham, Marquess of Montrose, and Archibald Campbell are both memorialized in this cathedral. Edinburgh is very tourist-friendly, and like most European cities, most of Edinburgh is cashless. Both phone and card payments are widely accepted. However, taking a few pounds with you during your visit is recommended to cover for things like tips for tour guides and street performers. Getting around Edinburgh is very simple too. A network of buses is available all throughout the city and a few trams in certain parts. Taxis are abundant, but rideshare apps like Bolt and Uber can be used here too. Another good option is a hop-on, hop-off bus. But best of all, it is very walkable. And for us, it was the best way to experience what the city has to offer. Edinburgh is a very special city that both Adrian and I would like to return to in the very near future. But what made our trip here so memorable and enjoyable we're the friendly citizens who are always warm, delightful, and hospitable. We hope you liked this video and found our tips to be helpful. If you'd like to see more, subscribe now to see more of our upcoming videos. Thank you again for watching, and we can't wait to see you again soon. Stay curious and keep exploring.